Hi, you're listening to Redneck Theology, a short program providing a common sense look at Christianity. I'm your host, Bill Witte. Questions or comments may be emailed to redneckTheology at gmail.com. Now, on with the broadcast. Why all the rapture talk? Recently, someone mentioned they didn't talk about the rapture much. They even felt a bit uncomfortable around people who made it a topic of discussion. Now, just in case you're not familiar with the term or not positive what I'm referring to, uh, let, me, let me clarify what I mean when I speak about the rapture. The word rapture it actually means catching away. It's a word Christians use to describe the key event ushering in the second coming of Jesus. Approximately seven years before Christ physically returns to the earth, he will call his followers to meet him in the clouds, and from that point on to forever be with him. True Christians who died will be the first to be transformed. Their dead, decayed bodies will be transformed into a new body and reunited with their spirits. Next, those that are alive at that time will undergo the same transformation. All will then be caught up in the clouds to meet with Jesus and remain with him forever. This is according to the scriptures in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 to 17. And all this will take place in just a, a brief instant. Well, this has always been a topic of teaching, preaching, and discussion among Christians. But in recent months, it's begun to move to the forefront of speech with an ever-increasing frequency. Popular, well-known preachers and teachers, as well as pastors, teachers, and evangelists on local levels, presently make mention of the event in sermons and lessons centered around subjects other than end-time happenings. Current network television and movie themes range from hinting about the rapture to actually mentioning it in their storyline or plot. What is behind the increased focus on an event many claim is a religious myth, or won't take place for a long time, if at all. Amid the flurry of factors fueling the increased interest in the rapture, one of the most respected evangelists in the world recently commented he believed God told him the rapture would take place before the 2016 elections in the United States. Well, the 13th chapter of the book of Matthew tells of many things that must take place prior to the return of Christ. The Bible tells us here, as in many places, that no one, including the angels in heaven, know the exact time. Now, we're told, however, we may be aware of the general time or the season. We can know the time is near. The 13th chapter of, of the Gospel of Mark, in the 29th verse, says, So ye in like manner, when ye shall see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh, even at the doors. The first couple of verses in First Thessalonians gives insight that we may know as to where the right season when it approaches. People have predicted the return of Christ for years. Followers of Scripture know as soon as someone predicts the, the time or sets a date, they reveal themselves as a false prophet, since the Bible tells us Jesus said, only God the Father knows of that time. That's in the 24th chapter of Matthew, verse 36. Uh, Jesus spoke these words. He says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So why get all worked up over this latest prediction? Well, perhaps the, the reason to give more credibility to it is the fact it's not a prediction of the return of Christ at all. It's a warning the rapture may take place in the very near future. Even if the exact date of the rapture could be predicted, the exact moment of the return of Christ would still remain a mystery. We only know it will take place about seven years later. I say about because we have no assurance that the Bible refers to the Gregorian calendar that most of the world uses today. People long surmised the world situation couldn't get much worse than it was in whatever time they were living in. The overall state of the world fueled the belief the end was near, citing biblical warnings coming to pass, 
such as increased volcanic activity, earthquakes, uh, wars, rumors of wars, disrespect of children towards parents, a rise in homosexuality, and a host of other things. Depending on the time of the predictions, one or more prophecies still needed to come to pass prior to Jesus' return. One prophecy they all overlooked was the fact the rapture had not taken place. So their predicted date for Jesus' return could not be correct. Oddly enough, nobody I know of made their prediction seven years or more in the future, which eliminated any possibility for his return. In retrospect, some claimed afterwards they were referring to the rapture and not the return of Christ, even though they spoke of his return in their predictions. One major difference today rests upon the fulfillment of prophecy. No prophecy about the second coming remains to be fulfilled except for the Lord himself descending from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ rising to meet him, followed by those that are alive and remain. In short, the only event remaining to take place before the return of Christ is the rapture of the church. The bulk of Christianity has become lax and actually fallen into the devil's trap of complacency. They've heard the predictions. They've heard the sermons, the teachings, the warnings. They've heard them so much and so often and so repeatedly, they no longer feel urgency. Since they no longer feel urgency to expect the rapture, they feel no urgency to examine their lives in the light of Scripture. Many sit in church week after week hoping they'll go to heaven when they die. Hoping, not feeling convinced. They lack the certainty of where they're going. And churches are full of people that are afraid to die. They don't want to think about the rapture or death simply because they're not ready. The book of Titus and Second Peter, among other places in the Bible, tell us to be looking for the Lord. Far too many live in a fear which prevents them from looking for the Lord, but rather living in dread of him. The majority of people sitting in churches in the United States have never led anyone to accept Jesus as Savior. Most sit and listen to inspirational messages, but don't act upon them. They give to promote the gospel message, while refusing to share the same message with those around them. They support missionaries and evangelists. They stand behind programs and projects to reach out to the poor the orphans, the abused, the elderly, the neglected, and the list goes on and on and on of all the good works they support and take part in. Yet the closest to them, they don't hear. They don't hear the gospel. Because the closest that they come to sharing the gospel is to maybe invite somebody to church. Why the increased interest in rapture talk? Because so few seriously look for and expect it. So few see clearly enough to understand it's real and about to happen at any moment. The rapture truly is imminent. Most of the movies and programs on television either make fun of those who believe or they portray the events surrounding the rapture as science fiction. They promote the idea it's nothing to voice concern over or it's an imaginary event that weak-minded religious zealots look forward to as a way of comforting themselves in the face of ridicule. We talk of the rapture because many will miss it in spite of all the warnings. The movies, the stories, the theories, the speculations, and even ridicule can never change the facts of what the Bible says. The Bible warnings don't and won't change for any reasons. The warnings and predictions were recorded so that we could have an opportunity to receive forgiveness for our sins through Jesus and look forward to the future. Matter of fact, we are told to comfort one another with the words of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17 that tells about the rapture. The next verse following that, that explanation or that telling us that uh, it's coming says, Wherefore comfort one another with these words. The rapture is our blessed hope. We look forward to it. It's not something to be feared, but a blessing to look forward to. 
We call it blessed hope. It's really that we are blessed because we have this hope to look forward to. The abundance of talk about the rapture is happening because God is merciful. He's calling out to humanity one last time. God urges us to accept Jesus' gift of salvation and commit our lives to him. He's calling those unsure of their eternity to humble themselves to turn to him. He's presenting an opportunity to look forward to the soon approaching rapture of the church. The question is, will you accept this invitation? Will you accept his invitation? Or continue just going on your own way? If you desire to commit your life to God and truly be a Christian, then pray with me now. Repeat this prayer and as you say it with me, mean the words as if they were your own. Dear God, I admit I have sinned. I am a sinner. I'm asking for your forgiveness. I am trusting in Jesus' sacrifice on the cross as payment for my sins. I want Jesus to be my Lord, my boss. With your help, I will turn away from sin and live according to the Bible. Now, if you prayed that and meant it, take a moment just to tell God thank you for making you a Christian. Tell as many people as you can what just happened. It's important. I'd love to hear from you as well. It's important to talk to God daily. And that's really what prayer is, talking to Him. It's also important to read the Bible. Before you start, ask God to help you understand it. I know some of you have tried to read the Bible before and didn't really understand it, didn't make much sense of it, didn't know where to start. Just one reason or another, it, it just didn't seem all that interesting. Well, whether you've read it before or not, you'll find that opening it now opens up a whole new world to you. You'll understand it like, like you've never understood it before. And it's especially important. Ask God to help you understand it. I mean, actually, he's the one that wrote it. It's his words. So you can ask the author to help you understand what he meant. I suggest starting with the book of John and read some portion of it every day. It doesn't matter if you're a real good reader or if, if you're a poor reader. Read some portion of it. Set a goal, a certain amount, and read that every single day. If you're not already in a church, find one where the Bible's followed, and you can learn more about God and His Word, and you'll, you'll draw strength from that and from worshiping with other Christians. And if you are in a church, and you prayed this prayer with me, I know it's going to be difficult for you, but it's especially important that you let those around you know that you really weren't a Christian and you now became a Christian. The promise that Jesus will soon call us to meet him in the clouds, it now extends to you. A place in heaven is reserved for you. Whenever the rapture occurs, we'll meet in the sky on our way to meet with Jesus. Until then, Let's help others understand why there's all this talk about the rapture going on. That's our program for today. I'm Bill Witte, thanking you for listening to Redneck Theology. Your questions or comments may be emailed to rednecktheology at gmail.com. Please join me again next time for more Redneck Theology.